Welcome, 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 Stevens community. Welcome to all of our amazing constituents. So welcome to our undergraduate residential students. Welcome to our online students. Welcome to our graduate students. Welcome to our phenomenal full-time faculty. Welcome to our awesome part-time uh, adjunct faculty. And welcome to our amazing staff, full-timers and part-timers. Welcome to any Stevens alums who are here and welcome to any Columbia community members that are here. Welcome, welcome, welcome to all of the herstory, their story, them story, and history makers who have chosen to join us today. Thank you for prioritizing this time. So we wanna thank the equity offices and compliance who are comprised of our ADA section 504 coordinator led by uh, Sadie Mayerstrand. We wanna thank Shannon Walls, who is the special assistant to the president and our Title IX coordinator. And we wanna thank uh, Sean Dial, which is me, the inaugural director of diversity, equity and inclusion with Stevens College. And so the three of our offices combined to do programming like this. And this is the second of six facilitations offered this spring term of 2021. Our next facilitation will be Wednesday, March 3rd, and that will be a return visit from the cell. And that is the Services for Independent Living. And we'll continue our dialogue and increasing our awareness on how individuals navigate the world with visible and invisible disabilities. So save the date and register, and you already have your Zoom information. As for today's facilitation, it is absolutely my honor to introduce you to the co-facilitators. First, we have Tracy Davis, pronouns she, her, and she serves as the secretary on the board of directors for the Center Project. She is the co-coordinator of Gender Blender, a support group for gender non-conforming individuals and is the coordinator of TCP, that's the Center Project's clothing closet. Tracy lives and works in Columbia and aspires to someday catch up on sleep. Mm -hmm. And it is also my pleasure to introduce you to Michaela Thompson, she, her pronouns. And Michaela is a recent biochemistry graduate from the University of Missouri, now working as a research coordinator at MOI. She's the newest member of the Center Project's Education Committee and excited to get more involved with the Columbia community. She is passionate about LGBTQ plus inclusive healthcare for both patients and providers. She spends her free time hanging out with her friends, baking bread, can I get some, and volunteering for the Missouri Crisis Line. And just in case you're not familiar, the Center Project is Mid-Missouri's LGBTQIA community center. The Center Project mission is to address the needs of LGBTQIA plus community members by providing resources, education, and a safe space for LGBTQ plus individuals to connect and grow. So Stevens community, you can just send positive energy as you are able and welcome Michaela and Tracy, our co-facilitators today on ungendered allyship on college campuses. Welcome, thank you for sharing your time, treasure and talents with Stevens. Thank you, Shishan, for that wonderful introduction. As we said, my name is Tracy Davis and thank you for attending our Ungendered Allyship webinar. Hi, my name is Michaela, just as she introduced us. If you have any questions during this, please feel free to submit those during the chat and we'll answer them at the end during our live Q&A. Ungendered allyship means working towards removing binary gender constraints from your working environments and also from your friendships. To be an ungendered ally also means to allow gender to be expansive instead of limiting, which requires viewing gender in a different way than what we are typically taught. We will begin today by examining cis normativity and the way it impacts both trans communities and cisgender individuals. A cisgender person is someone whose gender is aligned with the sex assigned to them at birth. Cis normativity is the societal ideal that cisgender people are the norm and the natural gender. So maybe some of you have heard of the concept of heteronormativity, which is the mindset that heterosexuality is the norm 
and this has produced oppression of LGBT people and has created social oppression and economic barriers for LGBT people. Similarly, cisnormativity produces these barriers for trans people because it positions cisgender people as being the norm. Cisnormativity exists in many different levels, interpersonally, structurally, and culturally. It is embedded into us even though we are even before we are born and impacts us throughout our entire lives. Cisnormativity also produces cisgender privilege, which refers to the unearned and unconscious benefits that cisgender people have in various aspects of our society. One example of cisgender privilege in practice can be seen by the relative ease cisgender folks have when changing their legal name in court and on documents upon getting married and divorced versus the serpentine labyrinth of red tape many trans people are put through to achieve these same ends. Throughout this training, you will be given an opportunity to reflect upon how cisnormativity and cisgender privilege manifest themselves in your life. There can be a tendency in trans 101 trainings to focus solely on the lives of transgender people, but we feel it's more valuable if cisgender people join with us to explore our relationships to gender, the gendered assumptions we perpetuate, and how those assumptions can be harmful. So now let's take a moment to reflect on your own gendered embodiment. How did you decide what to wear today? Do the clothes you picked out today express who you are in any way? Did you do your hair or did you put on makeup today? And if not, why? How are you sitting in your chair? Are your legs crossed like mine? Is your body closed in on itself trying to make yourself smaller? or are you taking up a lot of space at your seating area? Now let's think about how you communicate with others. Do you gesture with your hands? Are you touchy-feely? And think about the ways you interact with your friends. Are you the emotionally supportive type or are you more guarded? All of these things can relate back to the way we were taught how to be girls and boys and women and men. Growing up, you may have heard things like Boys don't cry. Ladies sit with their legs crossed. Men don't put a lot of effort into your appearance. Sugar and spice and unequal rights. All of these aspects add up to how we express our gender. So we are expressing gender every day, every minute, even if we don't realize it. Cisnormativity makes us think that only trans people are doing or performing gender because these gender expressions are different from what we typically associate with that person's assigned sex at birth. In reality, sex at birth doesn't have much to do with our gender. That's because gender is a social construct, meaning that we are told a story that gender is binary, but in fact, it is not. Gender is not a law of nature like, for instance, gravity. The difference between something like gender and something like gravity is that gravity works the same way no matter how humans behave, whereas gender is social, structural, interpersonal, and largely dependent upon human behavior, actions, feelings, and gender can differ greatly across time, culture, and place. Each of us expresses our gender in unique ways, right? Not all women, men, or non-binary people are or look the same. Cisnormativity produces the gender binary, which is the dominant cultural and social set of rules that positions males and females, men and women, masculinity and femininity as opposing categories that cannot be interchanged. When someone challenges the gender binary, they face repercussions. This is seen in the trans community through higher rates of homelessness, unemployment, being victims of violence, and not accepted by families. For those of us who accept gender in ways that aren't socially normal, socially acceptable, we experience transphobia, transmisogyny, and transmisogynoir. Transphobia is the hatred and pre prejudice that trans people face due to their gender identity. 
Trans misogyny is the specific oppression faced by trans women and trans feminine folks as a result of being both trans and feminine. Trans misogynoir is oppression faced by trans women and trans feminine people of color due to the added intersection of race. We have recently seen more attention to the issues of transphobia, trans misogyny, and trans misogynoir in social political movements. But we still overwhelmingly see trans women being left out of women's movements and black trans people being left out of Black Lives Matter movements even though Black trans women are arguably the most disadvantaged and targeted population in our society. We believe that starting to address these societal issues begins with understanding and working to dismantle cis normativity. As we previously discussed, cis normativity begins even before we are born. It starts with when we learn of the baby's sex. We make assumptions based off of the appearance of genitals of who the baby will be. And even sex is socially, socially constructed. We think of sex as two categories, as male and female. But with the existence of intersex people, we know that sex is not binary. Intersex people have variations in sex characteristics, such as chromosomes and hormones. Intersex babies make up about 3% of births. So these stories we have been told about sex and gender are not true, right? There are way more variations of human existence than our Western culture recognizes, but we make assumptions based off of these social constructions that we've been taught. We ingrained the anticipated and assumed gender into babies through the toys we buy for them, the language we use for them, the future hopes and wishes we have for them. Pay attention next time you're buying a gift for a young kid. How do you decide what kind of gift you're buying? Think about your go-to questions when you find out someone is having a child. Is the sex of the baby really the most important thing to ask the expectant parent? Now let's move away from compulsorily gendering starting with small children and continue uh, by not enforcing gender stereotypes on teens or adults in our lives as well. The process of gendering is compulsory, meaning it's an automatic process we do without really trying. Compulsory gendering isn't just harmful for trans people, but for cisgender people as well, because it places all of us in these rigid little boxes of what a girl or a woman or a boy or a man are supposed to be. Compulsory gendering is what makes it necessary for trans people to come out. See, coming out has its roots, roots in cisnormativity, considering that it is literally based on the idea that everyone will assume someone is cisgender up until the point you actively tell them otherwise. Often, even the times when people come right out and say, I'm non-binary or I am trans, people will respond with disbelief. Are you sure? People will ask sometimes more than once. This is just another example of cisnormativity in practice. Now here we have my friend, the gender unicorn. This graphic is all about understanding our relation to ourselves and our relation to others. So this isn't a graphic just for LGBTQIA plus people to fill out and understand themselves through. This is for everyone because each of us can be understood through a complex mix of all of these different spectrums. So as I talk through the gender unicorn, consider where it is that you fall on each of these spectrums. So starting at the top, gender identity is represented with a little rainbow inside of a thought bubble. This is showing that gender identity is self-configured. It's how we think of ourselves internally. So it cannot be observed from the outside because it's entirely self-determined. Gender expression is our outward appearance. This is our clothing. This is the energy we give off. It's how we walk, how we talk, how we gesticulate. It's the thing that is visible to everyone. Next, you'll see sex assigned at birth. Now, this is not a spectrum. It's based on a determination made by a doctor on the day you were born based on what they thought your genitals look like. 
So now we come to physical attraction. And I think we all know what physical attraction is, but I'd just like to point out that in addition to experiencing the attraction of men, women, or other genders, there are asexual people who are physically attracted to no one. Similarly, when it comes to emotional attraction, a person can be attracted to a mix of men, women, other genders, or one of them exclusively, or if you're panromantic, all of them. So take some time for yourself to reflect and think about where you might fall on each of different lines on each of these spectrums. Also, take some time to realize that none of this is fixed. None of these axes are fixed and they can readily change over time. They can also change independently of one another. So when you consider gender expression, you may ask yourself, how might environment change how you express your gender? I mean, when you're in a business meeting or you're home alone or out with your friends, is your gender expression different? Think about how your gender expression has changed over the years. And while you're thinking about that, think about how your biological state has changed over your lifetime. Instead of gender being binary, in reality, we have a whole beautiful spectrum of different genders, as we just saw on the gender unicorn. Transmasculine people are people assigned female at birth, but identify with masculinity or fall more on the masculine spectrum. Trans men would fall under this transmasculine category, as well as some non-binary people who present more masculine. Trans feminine people are people assigned male at birth, but identify with femininity. Trans women, as well as feminine non-binary people would fall under the category of trans feminine. Non-binary people are people who do not fit into either category of man or woman. There is not one way to look non-binary as non-binary people can present masculine, feminine, androgynous, or combinations of that. Countless non-binary identities exist. A few common ones are gender queer, bigender, gender fluid, agender, and pangender. It is important to remember that these identities can mean different things to different people. Non-binary folks can and often do identify as trans, but some may not identify as trans. Every transgender person's experience with their gender and understanding of their gender is different. Some trans people experience gender dysphoria which is the physical and psychological discomfort of one's body due to their gender identity not matching up with their assigned sex at birth. Gender transi transition helps alleviate gender dysphoria. Transition has often been found to have positive outcomes such as improved quality of life, greater relationship satisfaction, higher self-esteem and confidence, and reductions in anxiety, depression, suicidality, and substance use. Transition can also look many ways. Trans people can socially transition, such as changing clothing or hair to match their gender identity or change their name and pronouns. Or they can medically transition, which can consist of a variety of methods of hormone replacement therapy, as well as gender confirmation, confirmation surgeries. Not all trans people desire medical tra transition and there is not common end goal for transition. It is important to note that medical transition, especially gender confirmation surgeries, can be extremely expensive, and many health insurance policies do not cover medical gender transition, which makes medical transition unattainable for many transgender people. Transgender people are four times more likely to live, before the live below the poverty line and experience unemployment twice the rate of cisgender populations. Black trans people experience four times the unemployment rate. So not every trans person desires or has the financial ability to achieve the cisgender standards of beauty. The need for trans people to look cisgen like cisgender people and to focus on passing is problematic and harmful. For many, passing is a process of using a cultural language of gender signifiers to prompt people to perceive us as our authentic selves. For some mothers, the goal of passing is to blend into cisgender society. And passing is not just about physical appearance, it's about your social relationships as well. However, the goal for most not binary trans people isn't to pass perfectly, 
but to really seem like our gender to people around us. I want people to see me as a woman, not out of politeness or respect for my identity, but just because I seem like a woman to them and because I am a woman. Social dysphoria is the anxiety I experience whenever I feel like I just don't feel like a woman to other people. But passing is much more than merely an attempt to fit in. Passing, when it's physically available to trans people, can be a way of gaining access to resources, rights, and respect. While it's certainly true that conforming to the gendered expectations of others can make it easier to gain acceptance, passing can also be a matter of personal safety against gendered violence. Unfortunately, being outed as trans can be dangerous in certain situations. I have personally had experience where a man approached me assuming I was cisgender only to see his demeanor go from amiable to ominous as soon as he realized that I was trans. And I know a number of trans women and non-binary folks who will dress more masculine when they visit certain parts of the country just because it feels safer to pass as a cisgender man. So now we're going to watch this video of Janet Mock, who is a transgender woman and author and TV producer. In this video, she flips the script and asks the same inappropriate and invasive questions to the reporter that she encounters regularly while doing interviews and also just in day-to-day -day life. So we're gonna watch the beginning of this video real quick and then um, talk about it. <laughs> So I'm here with Alicia Menendez. First off, you're beautiful. Thank you. And what's so amazing about you is that if I were to look at you, I would have never not known that you weren't trans. So who was the first person you told your sis to? I have never been asked or felt the need to tell anyone that I was cis. Do you have a vagina? When was the moment that you felt your breast budding? Did you use tampons? I thought we were talking about my show. Well, I think we need to get through this. These are just the preliminary okay. questions. When you were going through puberty, did you feel trapped by the changes your body was going through? Did you feel like a girl? I don't even know what that would feel like because I was told that I was. Do you feel that your, your idea of self, your cisness holds you back in any way? Just the one thing. What do they need to know about cis people? I think you're incredibly brave to be a cisgender woman in this world. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, so the beginning of that video really highlights a lot of questions people are asked when someone learns they are trans, and um, those questions aren't necessarily to understand who they are. These questions are more like an investigation to prove someone is authentically their gender yeah, identity great. rather than yeah. trying to get to know the person. And just like cisgender people, trans people are more than genders right. and their bodies. Um, so you'll be coming in by the circle drive. Most people understand by now that asking invasive, invasive or degrading questions about my physical anatomy, fascinating though it may be, is pretty inappropriate especially when those questions are irrelevant to the conversation at hand. <laughs> but let me tell you, I feel a great swell of anxiety wash over me every time I hear the phrase, can I ask you a question? Because the ensuing question is almost always distressing. Okay, story time. Once a very sweet and well-meaning woman said to me, apropos of nothing, can I ask you a question? Are people mean to you? <laughs> <laughs> Why no, darling, everyone adores me. Why would you possibly presume anything to the contrary? Now, one of the troubling aspects of her question is that it had no context. It just came out of the blue. But there was also the implication that being trans is somehow burdensome to me. Okay, here's another weird example. A couple of summers back, I had this date. Now, since I was meeting him in a restaurant near my building, I decided to just walk over there. So here I am waiting at the crosswalk, dressed to the nines, feeling just a little anxious about the date when a woman approaches me. Can I ask you a question? Can I have a hug? <laughs> now, I enjoy a warm hug. I really do. But I couldn't help but feel singled out 
and a bit objectified. She acted as though she'd spotted an exotic bird, just wanted to get a selfie with it. Okay, let me throw you one last example. Uh, once someone asked me, can I ask you a question? Um, what did trans people think of that movie? <laughs> and I said, your limited experience with exceptional gender expression does not make me the voice of all trans people. You must remember to always respect a person's individuality. As they say, no group of people is a monolith and everyone has their own unique experience. As we've been discussing, people's gender expression can look all different ways. We cannot make assumptions about what pronouns or other gendered language, such as mom or brother, people use just based on their gender expression. That's why it's always important to ask someone's pronouns and offer your own pronouns as well. By offering your pronouns first, it makes it safe for trans people to share their pronouns. This helps to normalize pronoun sharing in our culture. Another example of using non-gendered language could be instead of referring to that woman over there, you say that person in the red shirt. Misgendering is when people use the wrong pronouns or gender form of address, and a lot of the shared discomfort and awkwardness surrounding misgendering could be avoided if gender neutral language were used in the first place. Often the most awkward part of misgendering is when someone realizes they made a mistake and profusely apologizes and puts the mis and that puts the misgendered person in the position of saying, oh, it's okay. Mistakes do happen. And a quick apology is nice, but what is better is restating your sentence with the correct pronouns or non-gendered language so that the trans person is not responsible for comforting or correcting you. Also correcting others around you who may be misgendering someone, even when that person is not present is also important to consider. I feel like the best way if someone corrects you to handle it is just to say thank you and move on. Another quick note on pronouns, when speaking about the past, it is generally preferable to use a person's current pronouns. Again, if you don't know, just ask. I meet a lot of trans people who are early in their transition, and I always take care to get their pronouns correct. Not just because I want to be polite or because I want to acknowledge the reality of their gender identity, but also because transitioning is a process of reintegrating yourself and re-socializing yourself into the world as a different gender. And requesting new pronouns is a small but significant part of that process. And a small but significant thing you can do is to practice someone's pronouns. This doesn't happen overnight and you'll actually need to practice. When I learn someone's new pronouns, I'll talk to myself in the car or in the shower or practice just forming sentences using these pronouns, especially if they're pronouns that I don't typically use or hear, such as Z's ear. We don't use these pronouns in school, even though they are legitimate, grammatically correct pronouns. So we have to practice. Also, when you don't use somebody's correct pronouns or names, that is conveying disrespect for that person, negative beliefs about trans folks, and um, in, in acceptance. It also allows um, for the misgendering or inaccurate use of pronouns to continue for that person. So this is why um, using the correct pronouns and names are so important. So if I were a cashier at your local retailer and the person on the left were to walk in, I might ordinarily default to female pronouns such as she or her. But that would be wrong, since I happen to know that this person is not only a man, but is in fact my man, makeup artist extraordinaire John McClain, and John uses he, him pronouns. Likewise, if I were approached by the person in the center photo and I faulted, defaulted to female pronouns, once again I'd be incorrect, because this is Indian War. Actor on the television program Pose, one of Time Magazine's most influential people in the world, and India Moore is transgender, non-binary, and uses they, them pronouns. Finally, if I encountered the person on the right and use she, her pronouns, this time I would be correct, but not because she is cisgender or trans woman, but because she's gender fluid drag queen, Courtney Act, who uses male pronouns in boy mode and female pronouns in girl mode, as do most queens. 
So we should understand that there are gender nonconforming men who present very femme but use male pronouns. And there are also cisgender men who use female pronouns when they present female. There are non-binary people who use they, them pronouns, and there are also gender fluid people who use different pronouns depending on their current presentation. Additionally, we may encounter pre-transition trans people who identify as a gender other than the one they currently present and live as, but still use other pronouns that align with their identity. So you can't really rely on the way a person looks because there are a lot of situations where the way they look does not tell the whole story. But being a trans ally is more than just pronouns. It's about ungendering our brains and unlearning cis normativity. Ungendering your brain in practice means to meet someone without immediately sorting them into pre-existing arbitrary gendered categories. It also means moving beyond memorizing pronouns and instead reconceptualizing how you view that person's gender. So think to yourself, how do you refer to the trans person in your head? What pronouns do you use when they are not around? Did you correct yourself when you misgender them in your mind? Do you correct others who misgender them when you're not around? Are you trying to look past the person to find the gender that you think they used to be? Ungendered allyship looks like creating trans inclusive spaces, even if you are not around trans people in your space that you know of, and being critical of those gendered spaces you encounter. Ask yourself, who am I leaving out? Rethink the necessity for obtaining information about gender and whether that is in your conversation with trans people or on forums at your workplace. While gender can certainly be an important factor in a trans person's life, gender is not the root of all trans people's problems or is the only relevant aspect of their life. Now, let's examine what it feels like to be thrust into an environment that does not feel inclusive for every student. We've talked quite a bit about why pronouns are important and why it's important to practice using the correct pronouns. But what does it feel like when one is misgendered? What damage is wrought when a student is put in a position of responding to a name that no longer applies to them? I rarely get misgendered these days, but every once in a while, someone will surprise me and call me sir. And I brush it off fairly easily because I'm serving up enough feminine realness that if you can't perceive it, that's sort of a you problem. But not everyone is blessed with my level of confidence. And when I was early in my transition, being misgendered was an everyday indignity in my world. And I would blame myself. Every single time I would blame myself. I would think it's my voice, isn't it? Or, well, <laughs> I'm never wearing this outfit again. It would completely take me out of the moment and send me into a spiral of self-doubt until I could locate the nearest reflective surface and reassure myself that I still existed. I'm certain that keeping students focused is challenging enough without sending them into an existential crisis. Best to just completely avoid any distractions related to misgendering somebody. When a student is worried about being misgendered in front of all their peers, it can cause them to avoid class participation and reduce their capacity to network with the other students. And I know what a rare occurrence this is, but some students may even go far, so far as to skip class, perish the thought. I've spoken a bit about the ways a public outing can impact personal safety to a disastrous degree, but we should also consider how it feels to be othered in a group setting. To illustrate this, Believe it or not, your Aunt Tracy has another story to share. So a couple of years back, my day job sent me to a leadership conference in another state. Now our HR department went to great lengths to inform the organizers that I was a trans woman. Mostly out of fear, to be honest, that oh, someone might have to share a hotel room with a trans. Now, I consider it objecting, but your girl got booked her own suite. And I'll take the long end, this, uh, long end of the stick if it comes my way. 
Now at the time, I had already spent a couple hundred dollars in a day in court having my name legally changed, but I was still waiting on a corrected social security card. And my employer wouldn't change my official records without that new card. Anyway, I arrive at the conference and I scan the room for my assigned seat, only to discover in big shiny gold letters, a nameplate emblazoned with my dead name. Now for the uninitiated in the trans community, we refer to the name we discarded because it does not belong, does not align with our gender identity as our dead name. So I quickly toss the nameplate into my purse, out of sight, out of mind. There are a lot of painful memories that I associate with that name, and I've gone through great lengths to erase it from existence. So imagine my dismay when the group facilitator decided to take role and in doing so, announced my dead name for all to hear. And now I had to meekly raise my hand. I would have walked out, but they were buying us all lunch and I already had my heart set on the Huevos Rancheros. But all during lunch, it was so obvious that everyone was doing a lackluster job of pretending not to stare at me. Every time I'd look up for my eggs, a concert of heads would turn away in unison. And I can guarantee no one remembers anything else that the lecturer said that day. If you use example scenarios in your classes, check them for cisnormativity and heteronormativity. For example, if there's a relationship involved, is it always someone with a feminine name and someone with a masculine name? And remember to portray trans and queer people in positive ways. Often these identities are included only when they are part of a problem. Actively discourage homophobic and transphobic language in the classroom. This might show up with comments like, that's gay, or use of the words sissy or outright slurs or offensive jokes. If you have previously let these kind of comments slide, you probably need to practice how you would respond so that you can do it confidently in the moment. It can be as simple as, I'm not sure if you realize, but that language is harmful and it's not okay to say that here. If a student is experiencing discrimination on campus, you can support students in reporting to your Title IX coordinator who is responsible for responding to all concerns related to non-discrimination policy. There are some simple ways that you can get a student's correct name and pronouns at the beginning of the semester. You may call roll on the first day by saying each student's last name and requesting that they share their first name. Then you make sure you document and save the list of correct names. Now this is useful for many reasons aside, those really, aside from those related to gender. For students who go by a shortened version of their name or have a name you're not familiar with or a couple examples. This ensures that everyone is referred to respectfully and in the way that they prefer. You can encourage the sharing of pronouns by modeling sharing your own. When you share your own, it opens the door for people to share theirs. Normalize pronoun sharing, even if all, the student, all of your students are cisgender, as far as you know that is. The index card method is a great way to collect this information. And anything else you may wanna know about your students, like is there anything I should know that is important to your learning or anything you need to be as successful as possible this semester? Finally, make sure you don't share the information about a student's identity without their permission. Even if a student is very comfortable with and open about their identity, they should be the one and the only one who gets to determine who they come out to, when they come out and how. So these are some ways that we thought of that you could create a gender inclusive environment for your Stevens campus. Um, if you're answering the phone, not uh, assuming gender by the pitch of, pitch of voice. Online forms, is it necessary to have gender or to have them select Mr. or Miss? Or if you do need gender on a form, make sure that you have inclusive options. We're happy to help you with that list if you don't already have one. In face-to-face -face interactions, make sure you're using non-gendered language with all people. 
a personal example of this in my life is that when I was a summer welcome, summer orientation leader at Mizzou, um, our summer, we really focused on um, unlearning gendered terms. So it's really easy um, when addressing a group of people to start with, hey guys, but that summer we really focused on greeting everyone that we met as hello everyone, hello future tigers, hello students, hello guests and parents. Um, and these interactions were just to uh, make sure that we're not gendering every part of our language and these um, helped us with interactions with students and others at the college too. Creating a gender inclusive workplace involves two key issues, protecting and promoting the rights of all people of all gender identities and expressions and increasing employees understanding and acceptance for their trans and non binary colleagues. Um, and as leaders, we should model these policies consistently in both our words and our behaviors. First. You can keep a record of employees chosen names and correct pronouns. This helps ensure that whenever possible, appropriate terms will be used for personnel and administrative purposes, such as directories, email addresses, business cards, name plates. Second, encourage all employees to use name badges and email signatures that include their desired name and correct pronouns. This helps people learn those names and pronouns and cultivates awareness of the varying gender identities that their colleagues may possess. So how can we create a gender inclusive workspace for staff and faculty? You can start with healthcare policies that support medical gender transition you can ask employees um, that may be transitioning what they need to be supportive and how they would like this process of coming out and or transitioning in the workplace to, the, to be handled. Do they want it to be a mass email that goes out to everyone? Do they personally want to come out to the people that they deem important so that not everyone needs to know via email? It's truly up to that person how they come out and how they choose to do that and who they choose to do that with. And another way you can include, like make it a gender inclusive workplace is to make sure that your HR is well trained and well equipped to support queer and trans employees that you may have. So what we're hoping folks take away from this is to really challenge yourself to think differently about your own gender and other people's gender identities and expressions, and to challenge yourself to dismantle your assumptions about gender. Here are some things to remember going forward. It's okay to make mistakes and thank people for correcting you. It's okay not to know someone. We should always acknowledge our limitations. If you don't know, just ask. Keep making progress through continued education. You can read books written by trans people, watch documentaries, and of course, listen to trans people. Believe us when we tell you who we are. Um, like I said, if you don't know first, try educating yourself. And if you still aren't sure, that's when you ask. And it's always good to recognize our own discomforts and then investigate what it is that guides our thoughts, our feelings, and our attitudes. Center Project is a grassroots nonprofit organization and then Missouri's only regional center focused on the needs of the LGBTQIA community. Support for the Center Project benefits the quality organizations we host, including Gender Blender, a social network and support group for gender nonconforming adults, the Clothing Closet, which provides queer and transgender people in need with gender affirming clothing. PRISM is an LGBTQ youth group for young people ages 11 to 18 years old in the Mid-Missouri area. Parents for Parents is a group of parents of LGBTQ kids to learn how to better understand and support their child. We also have various other events and opportunities throughout the year, so be sure to keep in touch. 
And if you're interested in trainings like this or other trainings for your organization or your workplace, please email us at the Education Committee email or fill out the training request form on the Center Projects website. And now we can take a few of your questions from the chat. Let me see. I think I will. Wow, fantastic, Tracy and Michaela. Thank you for the research, your sharing of lived experiences, your exquisite storytelling, and of course your investment in time. I was blessed to see Tracy uh, present at the Inclusive Impact Institute and you are phenomenal. I just love the way that you weave humor and uh, clever wit and everything else into it. And for those who don't know in our Stevens community, this is Michaela's first presentation with the Center Project. So I'm on behalf of our constituents, I know they would, we are giving you both positive energy, a round of applause, support and appreciation for doing a phenomenal job to raise our awareness and give us so many tangible takeaways, nuggets, gifts, and calls to action. So just wanted to make sure we named that. So yes, uh, I just put in the chat, sorry, it went to the panelists and then it went to the panelists and attendees. So please share uh, any questions that you may have. I wanna acknowledge we have at least one of our board of trustee members. Thank you, Sarah Crosby for attending. We appreciate uh, the leadership and the hard work that you and your fellow board of trustee members uh, give to Stevens College. Thank you so much. Thank you so yes. much, everyone. Yes, so lots of love coming through <laughs> the chat. I know, I know, I'm just reading them all. Oh. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. You really love oh, Valerie Shaw is here as well, another board of trustee member and a Stevens alum, uh, both of them, Sarah and Valerie. So thank you, Valerie, for prioritizing time and joining us. And if you do have a question, this is a safe space. Um, this is the time to ask those um, silly questions that you've always wondered but were afraid to ask. Um, yes, thank you, Tracy. And we have a third board of trustee member, Ellen Volrath, another alum. Thank you so much for continuing to uh, give of your time on behalf of Stevens College. Thank you all for being here. So I always say there is no silly, strange question. Uh, the only harm that you do is if you leave with the question, right? Because then you're only harming yourself. And thank you to the Board of Trustee Board Chair, Mark Taylor, also here today. Thank you all so much. Board of Trustees of Stevens College is in the house. Thank you so much. So one of the questions that, you know, I get a lot and another folks who may be involved in this work is kind of all about the alphabet soup. And I think that there's so many varying perspectives about you know, LGBTQQIAAPPDS-2 plus and the variations. So what are each of your perspectives, feelings around the evolving letters that represent sex, assigned at birth, gender identity, gender expression, attraction, and behaviors? Well, I always tell my little eggs that um, there are like as many like unique experience with gender as there are people in the world. Um, so I'm not terribly concerned with um, the labels or the ideology that people have. Those things, those metaphysical arguments, they just don't matter to me. What matters to me is the political struggles that we all share, um, the struggles for respect, the struggles for rights, um, the struggle against medical gatekeeping and the struggle to be included in public life. Those are the things that unite us and those are the things that we combat, but also we like to get together and we like to celebrate each other. Yes, I agree with Tracy on that. I mean, when it comes to lettering and stuff like that, I typically just say LGBTQ plus because that's what I most often say, but 
when it comes to it, the lettering and the titles don't really matter. What matters is the individual people and asking the people you're with and you're around, you know, how, like, how do you want me to refer to you? How do you identify? Asking them about their own personal experiences is always best practice. Thank you. So there's a comment. Thank you, Valerie, who says this was so helpful. I realize I still have much to learn. I appreciate your willingness to educate us. Yes, thank you all for the sweet comments. <laughs> what a sweet community. Stevens is hungry to learn for sure. I love that. Yeah, we, I'm very touched by all of the um, steps towards inclusivity that your college campus has taken um, recently and over the years. Like I danced a little dance um, back when you started to admit uh, transgender and non-binary women. Um, and, you know, I'm, it made me thrilled. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So do either of you have tips? Uh, our LGBT club just recently selected a new name, rebranded. And at one point uh, there was two different clubs with kind of two different visions and missions and they've decided to combine and try to do and both some little bit of sacred space and truck community work. And then of course, educate the larger community. So what tips would you have for leaders in that club or members of that club or the larger Stevens community of students, staff, and the faculty to support that club? Um, well, the first thing that I would say is, um, and when you're on college, like don't forget to have fun, don't forget to enjoy and make these things, um, places that people want to come to these meetings, like, um, and be sure that you hear from everybody, give everybody a chance to participate but also um, it's important to stay up to date on the um, local and statewide issues that come along. You know, every year there's um, some silly bill that I have to go and demonstrate against that gets raised. And just when I think I've defeated the monster, um, it comes rising back up and I have to talk about it all over again. Um, and so um, that's the other thing is when you're engaging in, um, we are engaging in political activity, like don't give up, don't ever quit because we have to be um, relentless to fight for one another, just the way like our voices need to be heard, you know? Yeah, thank you, Tracy. I would just say, you know, make sure they focus on their community, focus on growing the relationships with each other, you know, growing the strength of the club um, and then, you know, make sure you focus on yourselves first, because there can be a lot of pressure with educating others or being, you know, maybe one of the only queer people in your space. You know, there can be a lot of pressure on someone to maybe feel the need to represent the whole community if they're one of only a couple in their space. So make sure that they, you know, have strong relationships with each other um, and that they don't have to represent the whole queer community in their space. You know, just start small with educating. Don't take on too much on your plate. Um, don't take on too much with different campus events. Um, but yeah, focus on yourselves. Make sure everyone is safe and feels has all their needs met, feels loved. And then if you feel like you can take on campus education or other events after that, then do that. Thank you. So a colleague sent me an email. Their question was, uh, can you share a favorite resource, be it a book, documentary, artist, someone who brings you joy that you want to make sure we all know? Oh, my goodness. Maybe I should go to my bookshelf and check. <laughs> um, there's, um, oh, gosh. I actually am going to go to the bookshelf. I might talk while Tracy picks out a book. Um, so I used to be um, the speaker's chair at Mizzou. So I was in charge of contracting all of our different speaker events um, and planning those and executing those. 
And so my year, um, one of the people that I chose was Janet Mock to come speak. That was our first partnership with the LGBTQ Resource Center at Mizzou. And just being able to spend the evening with her, speak with her, um, and to see the impact that she was able to have meeting the people at our LGBTQ Center and how uplifting that was for people in the center and for the campus community as a whole. That was a really cool event that I'm so happy I was able to bring her to Mizzou. Yeah, I, I love her book. I'm a, um, I love the Juno Dawson. These are, um, Juno Dawson is a British person who is for, this is for adults. I'm not an educator. Um, so a lot of my reading is for my own personal enjoyment. And this is definitely um, one that I enjoyed as an adult. <laughs> um, but also, I mean, just check out, it's, you can be, you, you got to be really careful when you're looking for resources, because a lot of times the first thing that'll pop up on Amazon is something uh, that hasn't been researched, that's hateful, that um, you like need to make sure that you're getting from a trusted source. And I mean, often the way that you can do that is just read a few reviews of the book. And um, that's often the best way. I mean, there's like a book out now called Irreversible Damage that is irreversibly stupid. And, um, but it pops up as one of the first um, things if you're Googling, um, I'm a transgender parent, tell me some books to read. So that's something we always have to watch out for. Fantastic. We'll end with this one. Uh, one of our awesome colleagues, Philip, who's in our Student Success Center says, I benefited greatly from this webinar. I have worked on being a strong ally since a friend and former student of mine transitioned about a decade ago, and I still found many new strategies to help me improve. I'm curious if either of you have read Glitter Up the Dark by Sasha Jeffen or Geffen, which looks at how gender nonconformism has impacted pop music. I've been wanting to feature it in one of my freshman comp pop music class sometime in the future. If not, check it out. Thanks for the clear and engaging presentation. And Janet Mock is the bomb. Well, thank you for the recommend because I am not, uh, I have not read that book, but I would love to. Yeah, I have not either. I will be adding it to my list. I'm really interested in Natasha's question. Do we have yes, time to answer you. that? Real Absolutely, quick? We, we will make okay. time. Yes, go for it. Okay, well, Natasha's question is, what is the hope and expectation you have for the future of the medical community for LGBTQ patients and um, want students in the field to know and understand? So I'm currently applying to medical school. Um, I know like the medical school here at Mizzou has made a lot of great improvements for LGBTQ students. They have different organizations now. The Community Medical Center, MedZoo, which is free healthcare for the community, um, has a, like a trans night where they have different doctors come and help patients with their transitions and offer medications. So Mizzou has made, and uh, they have something called the Stitch Conference too. So Mizzou has made great strides um, and interacting with LGBTQ students, providers, and patients. Um, but my hope is that even more LGBTQ students will pursue the medical community. There's not, like if you look at the statistics, there's not a lot of LGBTQ students in STEM. It's just a really hard field to be in and it's often male dominated. Even my work here is heavily male dominated um, and there's not any queer people that I'm aware of that even work on my floor. Um, so it is a hard community to be in, but my, you know, just encourage students that if they want to pursue medicine or other STEM careers that they should, and it's important to have representation in those spaces. It's important to have physicians that, you know, look like or may have had some of the same experiences as their patients. And that would be my hope in going to medical school is that um, I am able to adequately treat queer patients and to share those experiences, some of those experiences at least with them. So my hope is that um, there will be more LGBTQ people in the medical field and that 
college students aren't discouraged by maybe the lack of current representation because they're the students that can change that for the future. And on the end from patients, um, like medical cake keeping has got to go. If somebody comes in and tells you that they're trans, they're not lying. They're not, um, it's like, it's a straw man to talk about all these people who are gonna detransition in the future, or they're just um, influenced by their peers or stuff like that. Those are things that somebody made up. It doesn't happen. Um, not with, not on any statistical level that makes any sense anyway. Um, people who having access to gender affirming health care is it decreases suicidality. So a lot of people there, speaking of some of the bills, there's a bill introduced every year um, to not allow anybody under 18 to have access to gender affirming care, such as um, puberty blockers which are completely reversible. If you changed your mind down the line and decided, you know what, um, my gender changed somewhat, it's fluid, you know, um, you just stop taking them and puberty will hit you like a truck, you know. Um, but at the same time, if you don't have access to this, trust me with the community I work with, my own personal experience, the depression, the, um, it can be debilitating. If you really care about the health of people, Gatekeeping has got to go. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Well, thank you both again on behalf of the Stevens community, students, faculty, staff, uh, alumni, board of trustees, Columbia members. We really appreciate all the work that you all do with the Center Project that you do within your own time, treasure, and talent. And really thank you today. Uh, for being a vendor of Stevens College and providing this amazing hour of information, takeaways, call to actions, um, and just storytelling. So we give you affection, positivity, warmth on frigid days and cool on warm days because the weather is definitely doing its own thing right now. Stevens community, again, um, you've been looking at the, the information with the center project so you can connect and refer students, uh, staff, faculty, colleagues uh, to the different services and groups of the center project. Uh, don't forget our third facilitation, uh, will happen next Wednesday, March 3rd with the SIL Services for Independent Living. And please be sure to open your emails that come from the equity at stevens.edu email address. That's where we'll let you know of opportunities on campus and off of campus to increase your awareness within racial social justice. We have the diversity, equity and inclusion a strategic plan listening sessions happening uh, two a week for every week in March. So look forward to more information coming in your email about that. So again, Michaela, Tracy, thank you so, 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 thank so, you. so very much. Thank and you. We look forward to continuing this relationship and thank you Stevens constituents for showing up and showing out in a very beautiful way. We reach, wish each of you uh, mental, physical, spiritual, economic, health, wealth, travel mercies, and all that good stuff during this week seven of the spring term of 2021. Thank you all so much. And thank you, Lita. We hope you feel better. Thank you for still going above and beyond and being here just in case <laughs> we had a technical meltdown. So thank you. And we send you good vibes of healing. Thank you all. Thank you.